pages yes we are live now we can begin hello everyone i am dr rahul manlik from sharina healthcare would like to welcome you all to this webinar this person we can see who is sitting on the top of the pile of the pills whose head is uh, now touching to the roof uh, this this picture depicts very popular pharmacology uh, phenomena it is called ceiling effect ceiling effect refers to the dose of medicine beyond which there is no additional benefit it means that if higher doses of medicine that is above ceiling dose is used that do not provide any additional benefit or it may increase the likelihood of side effects or increase in the cost of therapy so this particular phenomena is very much uh, is very well reported for analgesics too for instance we can see uh, in this graph when ibuprofen alone is used above 400 mg uh, it does not provide uh, the the big amount or the additional amount of analgesia and likewise it is equally applicable to other analgesics like paracetamol aspirin or codeine derivatives they also have their own ceiling doses and ceiling effect and this particular phenomena poses a very practical question in front of healthcare practitioners in treating the pain uh, that demands higher doses of individual analgesic agents particularly several acute painful conditions where opioids are not good fit and this webinar is going to address this particular issue shalina healthcare is operating for more than 35 years and today we are one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in sub sahara africa our mission is to make quality medicinal products and to make them available at affordable rates across the continent and we achieve this by manufacturing our products in our own who approved facility we strongly believe in giving back to the society by running a range of public health programs and campaigns in partnership with ngos institutions and universities we we are supporting our young talent and budding professionals right from their academic stage and we are also empowering our practicing healthcare professionals in this endeavor shalina academy is constantly providing online as well as offline learning platforms for our healthcare professionals and this webinar series is part of uh, this initiative well before we go to today's session we at shalina healthcare would like to wish all the pharmacists a very happy world pharmacist day thank you so much for serving humanity almost 24 by 7 today you are one of the one of the most trusted partner in healthcare value chain system thank you so much with this let me welcome our eminent speakers who are going to talk about multimodal pain management basics and best practices dr milton rap who is a director at pain clinic at christian bernard uh, memorial hospital in cape town south africa Uh, Dr. Raf is past president of Pain SA, that is South African chapter of International Association for the Study of Pain, that is IASP, and he is also an immediate past chairperson of Pain Committee of the World Federation of the Societies of Anesthesia. He is a past member of uh, the Developing Countries Working Group of the IASP and a counselor of the College of Anesthesiologists of South Africa. He is an editor of the Pain Essay Journal, and he is also a guest editor of many peer-reviewed international publications. Uh, Sir has authored many peer-reviewed publications and written many book chapters. Welcome to Dr. Rap, who is going to talk today about optimizing pain management using multimodal analgesia. Our next speaker is Dr. Ulu Sola, who is a lecturer. at department of <laughs> in university college hospital ibadan nigeria he is a fellow of faculty of anesthesia from west african college of surgeon and hospital consultant at department of anesthesia as well as honorary consultant at university college hospital in ibadan he is a member of nigerian society of anesthetists and also a member of a uh, faculty of anesthesia at national postgraduate medical college He has completed a course in obstetrics anesthesia from Church House Conference Center, 
uh, in London. And Dr. Olusola has published many articles in peer review journals. Welcome, Dr. Olusola. Uh, he is going to talk today on caffeine as an analgesic adjunct in multimodal analgesia. So audience, while taking, while attending this webinar, please feel free to post your questions in the space provided uh, on the platform. And we will take up those questions during Q&A session. So stay, stay tuned. Now I would like to hand over to Dr. Milton. Over to you, sir. Thanks very much, Dr. Mandlik, for your kind introduction. And, and thank you to your company for sponsoring what I believe is probably one of the most worthwhile things, and that is improving pain management around the rest of the world. What we noticed in the IASP as well as WIFSA is whilst there's tremendous strides made in medicine, there are very, very few strides made in managing pain. And educational facilities and undergraduate and even postgraduate have very little pain management courses. And the graduate is expected to manage people and the pharmacists are expected to suggest medication to people with very little training specifically in pain. So I hope to be able to advise you and to help you a little bit in this regard and look and see how we do pain management and what it's all about. So with that, let's proceed through this. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say today, as you can see, I've membered of many international faculties. And one of the boards that was put together really for international um, knowledge was a play on this no acute pain or KNOW or no acute pain NO. And this was an international consortium, as you can see, rheumatologists, orthopedic surgeons, I've put myself there in red, but neurologists, neuroscientists, in other words, a multi specialist organization to develop a lot of what we are going to speak about today. And I hope that after we've spoken the basics, you'll understand that the basics are what one really needs. I must make disclosures. I do have consultant, consultancy agreements, many speaker agreements, many research grants. But in real terms, today, this presentation is for education and it will not replace anything that you particularly feel. The opinions that I express are obviously are mine, but they are based very, very much on the science and the sponsors don't exhaust endorse or approve any of the accuracy or completeness. I've not been told what to say. They've said to me, please help with this initiative. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at pain and you'll see that the classification becomes absolutely important. We can briefly look at how prevalent acute pain is and is there an impact of acute pain? You've often heard, so they've got a bit of pain, so what? Well, let's look at that. Furthermore, it's how should we look at acute pain in clinical practice sort of in five minutes to make the assessment that the GP does have and then to get down to the crux of the talk. What is this flavor of the, it's now a few years, multimodal analgesia and draw some conclusions. So we all know in assessing any patient, one says, look at the vital signs, breathing, pulse, blood pressure and temperature. That's a little bit historic because today, uh, certainly in our hospitals around here, in the teachings around the world, we've now added what the WHO calls pain assessment, the so-called fifth vital sign. It needs to be looked at in every single patient that we assess. If you don't assess the pain, you will not manage the pain. So let's look at the classification first because there are three different things that one often fails to identify. The first one is that pain is a normal phenomenon. It warns us, it's physiological. It says this body, this being is being attacked. It is the early warning detection system. If you pick up a match and you burn, you'll put it down. If you put your hands into cold water, ice water, you'll take it out. And if you stabbed, you will react. This early warning is a sensing of a noxious or attacking stimulus to the body. And we would call that nociceptive pain. I call it ouch pain for teaching purposes, but nociceptive, good word. What is important? The NSAIDs, coxibs, paracetamol, and opiates will take care of the ouch. 
So the physiology says if you've stuck with a pin like this at the toe, this message will pass, as you see, to the spinal cord and then onto the brain. It's brief. If you withdraw the, the, the needle, it will stop. And that is physiological pain, and that will start the system going. The second system is the adaptive or the protective mechanism, such as in a burn. We've all seen a burn. Today it's not bad. Tomorrow it's raw. The blister has come off. It's not nice. It's red. It's painful. And that is where the tissue becomes highly sensitive after the unavoidable damage. And that is our immune system reacting. And we would call that inflammatory. Again, the same medication will work, NSAIDs, coxibs, paracetamol, and opiates for the inflammatory component. But let's look at this trauma inflammatory. If something happens, you will feel it at the big toe like we saw last time. It's at this stage that the talk today becomes important. If we do not manage this pain now, what can happen? At the spinal cord level, instead of the pain going away, abnormal circuits can start forming. If these abnormal circuits start forming, we get short circuits, and this pain then remains forever as we have not presented it, and it now becomes the so-called chronic pain syndromes. And then finally, there's the non-protective, maladaptive, non-physiological pain. It serves absolutely no purpose to anyone. And I mean by that shingles above, a stroke below, and what we would call neuropathic pain. Not protective in any way. And then these four, which many of you in general practice will know, on the top left, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel. On the bottom right, temporomandibular joint issues and interstitial cystitis. These are contentious. They are known as dysfunctional pain syndromes or central sensitization pain syndromes. What distinguishes all of these from the others? In that if you give NSAIDs, coxibs and paracetamol, you are wasting your time. The mechanism is wrong. Where nerves are involved, we have a different system active. So what is the nature of acute pain? The nature of acute pain like that is ouch. And we must remember it's usually responsive to NSAIDs, coxibs, paracetamol, and opiates. So that's your first take-home message. How prevalent is acute pain? In your lifetime prevalence in general population, it's 100% of everyone will experience acute pain, and they will all at some stage ask for use of analgesia. Emergency room visits will be two-thirds of all the visits will constitute pain. And finally, hospital patients, over 50% will report pain, either pre-surgery or after surgery. So you can see acute pain is a very, very prevalent, common type of pain. I understand there are a lot of general practitioners on today, and welcome. You are, in fact, as primary care physicians, the gateway to what goes on further. But look at what we see here. You look, if you look at the MSK, which is on the bottom and the right in purple and light blue, you will notice that and with green trauma, that musculoskeletal pain and trauma account for 72% of all acute pains. So three quarters of the patients you see, we know are going to have ouch, no susceptive pain. So does this do anything if you've got it? What happens if you've got, does it affect how you function? The answer is if you look at a percentage of patients, your favorite activity, nearly 80% of the people cannot do their normal favorite activity. They can't do their normal routine everyday task, including work. They can't enjoy family time. As you can see, that's 56% of the patients. And in fact, time with your spouse or significant other, again, around 50%, and even affect sleep. They can't fall asleep. They can't stay asleep, and that's 30%. So it's a severe effect of quality of life and daily function. So very quickly, as it's difficult to do in, in one talk, but how do we assess the pain? 
Well, the easy way is to start and ask a couple of questions, but these vary. Like, where is the pain? Is this a bone pain, etc.? How intense is it? Is it constant? Does it shoot every now and then? Is it intermittent? And they can describe whether it burns or it tingles or it's electric because it can give you an idea. And then from our GP point of view, is there anything that you do or have done or taken that improves the pain? And is there anything that worsens that pain? But that is subjective and the questions asked and it's not always understood. So, in fact, we can almost measure the pain intensity by using a simple, we'll look at this in more detail, on a 0 to 100, the so-called VAS, the visual analog scale. Or we can just do, if no pain is naught and 10 is the worst pain, how's your pain, a numerical rating scale. Or you can even say, when is it the time? My pain is at this time, it's mild, it's moderate, it's severe from 0 to 3. And time specific, when is this? Also, we can look at the effect on function, the impact or effect on function. And these are big questionnaires which can take seconds, but they can take a bit of time, such as the APS questionnaire, which tells you mood, waking, sleep, the APS. There's the brief pain inventory, but the one I use for neuropathic pain is the DN4, and that's a very quick thing. So there are actual, um, let's call them, forms that one can fill in. But it's simpler, actually, to use the visual descriptors. For example, there is no pain, there's the worst pain. That's the simple descriptive intensity. There's the 0 to 10 numeric pain scale that we spoke about. There is the face scale from a smile on the left to crying on the absolute howling on the right-hand side. And simply the visual analog scale at the top with the face. And so you can see these are easy for anyone you keep it in your notes. When they come back, you say from 1 to 10, where is your pain now? But so what? Is there a consequence besides function? There is a lot that one needs to look at. The first thing is the physical. They can't move. Their sleep is disturbed. And there's immune impairment. There is dependence on drugs or on family members because they cannot do things for themselves. And, of course, there's cost-wise, economics and hospital readmissions in terms of recovery. And as I showed you earlier, if you don't treat acute pain well, you stand the risk of developing chronic pain. So there is not just nothing that happens. So now we're talking and getting to the concept, why do we want to spare opioids? Why are we using multimodal, which we'll show you? Because of the side effects. And we all know side effects of drugs. Any drug can do all of this. GI, urinary, cardiovascular, nausea, pruritus, movement, sedation. Provision of analgesia is often limited by side effects. So single drugs often, because we use high doses, can cause side effects. Dropping the dose means we can minimize side effects. And patients, as I'll show you now, they place a lot of attributes on the acute pain therapy and 47%, so half of the patients will tell you they don't want the side effect. They'd rather have a little bit of pain than all of the side effects. And what are the adverse events? Constipation, cloudiness, itching, hallucinations, nausea. You can see nausea is in up to 70% of the patients, 80% with mental cloudiness. And what is the most common group of drugs that causes are the opioids. Hence, we say in the modern day, although opioids will cure just about anything except neuropathic pain, we need to try and reduce the dose. So here's the bit. How do we spare it? Multimodal analgesia. Now, in order to understand multimodal, we must understand how we treat pain. What are we doing? I'm taking you now back to first year medicine or second year medicine, whenever you were trained, to physiology 101. Multimodal means we treat multi receptors. Now, this sounds like a big scientific issue. Let's look. What one sees with any pain impulse is an incoming peripheral nerve will say pain, heat, touch, temperature. It takes it to the spinal cord dorsal horn, 
The spinal cord integrates this and says, right, I'm going to send this message to the cortex, which is going to tell me the location and the intensity of the pain, or to the limbic brain, which is the fear, anxiety, and sleep. The limbic brain has the ability to feed back by descending inhibition to allow us to alter the pain perception. So you can see, in fact, there are six, and I call it here, the students know it, the six bullet methods. We've got a gun with six bullets to control the pain. Let's look. In the periphery, the very thing that happens in the periphery, in other words, at the skin, that happens when we cut the skin is a sensitization. The skin becomes sensitized. What happens with the sensitization is that arachidonic acid is released. It attaches to a cyclooxygenase receptor, and we get prostaglandins coming back from those receptors, and everything gets released, the so-called inflammatory soup, histamine, serotonin, bradykydin, and what was a minor injury, as you can see, is a big inflammatory process. What do we do about this? If we can stop those prostaglandins, that is our step one, or bullet one, NSAIDs and coccyps, they will stop that as early as is possible. Should that message get past there and now go from the periphery to the spinal cord, you may remember sodium channels. You needed sodium in and out of a nerve in order for it to conduct. And if we block that nerve, it will not conduct the pain impulse. Step two are local anesthetics. And although it doesn't apply to general practice, we can, in fact, infuse lidocaine into the patients as an ongoing infusion. That will block the sodium channel. It will not let the impulse flow. Where do you see this in action? The dentist gives you a root block and you don't feel any pain. They don't do anything else. They just use the local anesthetic. Should the message get to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, what happens there? The impulse arrives, in goes calcium. If calcium goes in, the neurotransmitters are let out into the synaptic cleft and the message passes on. What happens at calcium, through this calcium channel, as you can see it represented here, and in yellow you'll see the alpha-2 delta gate control mechanism, if the calcium goes in, the neurotransmitter happens and the nerve conduction continues. We can block that. We can block it using gabapentin or pregabalin. So these drugs can be used. They mainly used for neuropathic type things and pain control in surgical cases, but it can be used out of surgery as well. Because if that nerve passes on to the next neuron, what we get then is the so-called NMDA, N-methyl D-aspartate receptor, which rapidly enhances the pain. And ketamine is used to block that. So you can see at the dorsal horn, step three or bullet three is the gabapentinoids and ketamine. Not always used in a general practice, but certainly used in pain clinics and specialist practices along the way. Once we're at the dorsal horn, going up to the brain to try and stop it, we need to look at the spinal cord. The spinal cord is not just single neurons, but a complete interaction between axons, dendrites, and big and small cells. The big so-called cells, the axons and dendrites, release COX-3 or cyclooxygenase 3. The little, what we thought were supportive cells, we now know are not supportive cells. They are glial cells and they exhibit COX-2. Clearly, anti-inflammatories have a role at this level, at the COX-2 level, and at the COX-3 level, paracetamol is the one that acts. So step four says NSAIDs, coxibs, and paracetamol. Now, if you look aside from the NSAIDs and the coxibs, all the other drugs act at different sites which means we can use all of those drugs at the same time, getting additive effects 
rather than interfering with each other. And once we get to the brain, I showed you there was a feedback. The feedback simply goes, what goes to the brain can be inhibited by descending serotonin or noradrenergic receptors, which is the fifth bullet, tramadol and pregabalin. And tramadol, we've used plenty of it. We know exactly what it does. Is that all we have? If they still have pain, of course, we've got new kappa delta receptors, the sixth bullet opioids. And remember, we would like not to use them, but you often cannot manage acute pain properly without them. So here's a little summary. Thinking of the six bullets at the periphery, prostaglandins. At the conduction level, local anesthetics. At the spinal cord, calcium channel, NMDA, we've got ketamine and gabapentin. At the spinal cord, the coxibs, the NSAIDs, paracetamol, the descending inhibitions, the tramadols, and finally the opioids. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, that's what we have. That is the physiology and anything else is not according to physiology. It takes the receptors and we treat the receptors. So how do we treat acute pain? We use the mechanisms involved. Now you understand what they are and why they work. And that is the so-called multimodal analgesic. Now, what is this and why is it important? Because we combine different drugs acting at different receptors by different mechanisms to get additive effects or synergistic. Because you get improved analgesia using more than one agent, and you can use a central acting drug and a peripheral drug. So in real terms, if you saw a patient with a script for six analgesics that I've shown you, there is nothing wrong with that pharmacologically and therapeutically. It's very unlikely you're going to see it in general practice, but certainly as an anesthetist doing serious major surgery, you will see that. So here's the story. Opioids are, receptive, are, are, are used in conjunction with the other groups that we spoke about to potentiate so that we can improve analgesia, we can decrease the, the dose of each drug and the severity of the side effects. So is this true? Have I made this up? Yes, no. Is this based on science? The answer is it's very much based on science. We in South Africa produced with the South African Society of Anesthesiologists the acute pain guidelines, which do show this. Uh, that's the 2009 version. It's certainly been upgraded since then. But the Australian college, ANSCA, have got this acute pain management scientific evidence. The fifth edition is available. And I would say to you, if you have time, it's free, it's downloadable, Go and have a look at it. It's 700 pages. You don't have to read the whole thing, but you'll see the science of what we have just spoken about. For example, you will see in both of those, do NSAIDs spare opioids? The answer is undoubtedly yes, but they must be given early. You will then find less pain scores. The opioid request will be increased and there will be less opioid consumed specifically in the first 48 hours. Another example, does paracetamol do this? Absolutely and exactly the same applies, rather early than late. What is the success rate if we combine these drugs? Now I'm going to show you one single chart. There are many ways of, of depicting this, but I'll show you sort of a success rate percentage achieving at least 50% from the Cochrane database, this is where it comes. And you can see success rates vary at very low 10% for aspirin alone, up to 70% for ibuprofen paracetamol combinations. Now, if you look at the top, you'll see ibuprofen 400, paracetamol 1000, but very, very little difference if you bring that down actually to more acceptable levels as we see in a lot of the products. But what you're seeing here is that the combinations, all of the combinations that you look at, and you'll see there's an ibuprofen caffeine on that chart as well, the success rate is good. But let's look at it specifically 
in hip arthroplasties where these have published, and this was a 2019 study, the pain scores at rest of the paracetamol and ibuprofen at rest out of 100, you can see 21 and 24. But what happens if we combine, like I've said, add the ibuparacetamol combination and you'll see a statistically significant decrease. In other words, multimodal has given better pain relief. And there you can see that in used alone. What about the opioid requirements? We spoke about decreasing opioid requirements. There you can see milligrams per 24 hours, fairly high. Have a look, it's decreased with a combination again. So morphine consumption is reduced more when used as multimodal rather than with single drugs alone. And then, as I said, when we don't win, we have to use rescue medication. Well, how was the rescue medication in those very same procedures? If you look, you'll see placebo 70% needed, 39 on ibuprofen, 50 on paracetamol, and right down to 34 when we combine the two. So we used less of everything, and that's what we need to understand. Is it true that the side effects are decreased? So there's individual. The placebo you can see is very high. Paracetamol alone, ibuprofen alone are much better than what we expected with placebo alone. But what if we combine it? Have a look and you'll see that it doesn't differ. In fact, it's slightly less than either drugs you used alone. In other words, we do not increase the risk of side effects by using more than one agent. So remember, we can spare the opioids, but we do not absolutely eliminate them. If everything fails in the multimodal, the five bullets haven't worked, you must use an opioid. How do we use it for acute pain? So you know yourself that there's a thing called pro Renata, PRN, and then there is by the clock. So in other words, you will get this four hourly. I advise our students not to use the so-called PRN because usually in a nursing situation in hospitals which are busy, PRN stands for the patient receives nothing. That's usually what happens. But in chart form, what you'll see at the top is the PRN and at the bottom you can see it every time of day, the pain scores, the mean pain intensity is much lower. The answer to that is dosing by the clock increases analgesic efficacy. You get to an anesthetic or analgesic level which is therapeutic rather than up and down without, as we saw in the introduction by Dr. Mandlik, reaching a ceiling effect. So I hope this makes a lot of sense to you. You can see that we have six classes of agents that we can use and that we should use. And these can be individually given, they can be given as combinations, they can be given in pre-prepared, let's call it dosage combinations as well, which are supplied. But what is ultimately what we're looking at? Understand that acute pain is extremely common. I told you it's about 100% in everyone asking for drugs at some time in their life. But in primary care, the most common is musculoskeletal pain. You must use, because of the physiology, you must use multimodal analgesia to effectively manage acute pain. And if the multimodal without opioids is proving insufficient, of course, introduce the opioids. Please give the drug regularly. Script it according to its kinetics, four hourly, six hourly, eight hourly, 12 hourly, and leave out the PRN. It means the patients will get better analgesia. And remember that you start early. The evidence says start early because timely and appropriate treatment may prevent the acute pain developing into a chronic pain. So I hope you've got an idea from the physiology. It's always go back to the basics, understand what we're doing, and then treat the physiology. You will then have effective pain management. So from my side, and this is Cape Town, those of you who've been here, that's in the very far top right, that's Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela was for many years of his life. And that's the table mountain with the cableway and in front of it, what they call Lion's Head. 
I thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I do wish you lots of luck in managing acute pain to improve, to improve our patients' well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rao. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Ulusola, please. Good afternoon all, and I want to thank Professor Milton for highly erudite presentation. I'm highly impressed. Thank you very much, sir. This afternoon, I'll be presenting caffeine analgesic adjuvant in multimodal analgesia. I'm Idowu Lushalakayaude from University of Hospital Ibada. Uh, doctor, doctor, will you please put it to presenter's view? What? There is this option of display settings at the top. Just give a click on that. Uh -huh. Very first option. Perfect. Let's begin, doctor. OK. Uh, on a lighter mode, I will start my presentation by quoting a, a Finnish American uh, software engineer. He said, and I quote, every time I see some piece of medical research saying that caffeine is good for, for you, I, I fight myself. Um, the objective of my lectures today are to discuss the basic pharmacology of caffeine, to describe the mechanism of action of caffeine, to discuss the analgesic effect of caffeine in isolation and in combination with other analgesics. The word caffeine has a German origin, coffee, which means coffee. Caffeine is a psychoactive and central nervous system naturally occurring stimulant of methyl-xanthine class. And like other, um, many other psychoactive uh, substances, it is legal all around the world. It, it, it affects so many, almost all the part of our body. And um, it's also improved the mood and concentration, sharpens focus and increased lifespan. Of course, this is has to do with the, the recent finding concerning its effect on uh, staving off Azemias and Parkinson disease. It's frequently added to mild and adjacent preparations. And it appears that independently, it has some analgesic effect of itself. Uh, coffee, and the, the main content of it, which is caffeine, is a commonly consumed substance. And um, it depends on how much an individual takes per time or per day. When an individual is, is said to be having a low intake level, that means that individual takes be, uh, below 100 milligrams per day. That's about up to like 75 milligrams per time. Why when individual is taking up to like 1,000 milligrams per day, said to be have high intake level, that's about the single dose, about 300 max of, um, of uh, caffeine, Why the moderate is in between both. And so many of the drinks that we take actually contain caffeine. Uh, in the coffee, that's up to 20, at up to 200 milligrams. And I grade coffee up to 500 milligrams. In tea, up to, up to like 50 milligrams. Most soft drinks are between, they are between 30 and 50 milligrams. While energy drinks up to 300 milligrams. Plain chocolate bar, about 50 milligrams. In dark chocolate, it can even be higher than this. And in most drug, usually not more than 200 milligrams. So in fact about caffeine. I um, from the coffee bean, and uh, it's a seed of coffee arabica. That's the name of the, of the plant. And it's, it's found in some fruit, seeds, leaves, and of some plants. And I mentioned earlier on, it is found in so many drinks, tea, energy drink, and cola. 
and are consumed globally in high, vo in high volumes. In 2020, almost 10 million tons of coffee beans were consumed globally. That's quite high. And WHO, uh, that's what the organization model list of essential medicine as a um, caffeine citrate as one of its essential drugs. So see, um, I, when individual is taking more than 10 grams per day in an adult, um, that is said to be at a toxic level. But usually most of the drugs that, that we consume are far less than this. Even people who take coffee as a drink probably take far, far less than this dose. The mechanism of action of pain We've been thoroughly lectured by uh, Dr. Melton, and I just want to just quickly mention the effect of a caffeine on action in pain. From the drawing, you could see that um, the in the brain and the spinal cord, at the junction between the axon and the dendrite of the brain, there's a, a, a space called and at this particular point, when there's any impulse, then adenosine will be released. Adenosine is a um, neuro inhibitory neurotransmitter. And when they are released, they bind to the receptor on the dendrite. But with the presence of the caffeine, because it shares the same structure with um, um, adenosine, so it's quickly bi it binds readily, more readily to the receptors thereby preventing the adenosine from binding onto the um, receptor, leaving maybe few, if at all, for adenosine to bind. Therefore, um, but it, it has unique property in which it binds like adenosine, but it does not reduce the neural activity like adenosine that is um, inhibitory in nature. I must tell you that um, the um, in the intestine, the caffeine is 100% bioavailable. The availability is 100%, and it's highly soluble in water and other non-polar organic solvent. And one is not surprised because of this, it crosses blood-brain barrier, act as vessel constrictor on cerebral vessels, thereby highlight its role in headache. We've been we've been talked to about multi multimodal analgesia. So for my part of lecture, the emphasis will be laid on only like half of it, which is we're talking about the adjuvant, this time around caffeine, then the NSAID, non surrender antiflammatory drugs, then paracetamol. To most people around the world, caffeine is a stimulant, but now there's paradigm shift, and we now know that it actually has an adjuvant to analgesic. An adjuvant is a substance that helps and enhances the effect of a drug, treatment, or biological system. And as I mentioned earlier on, its major effect is on inhibiting the adenosine um, receptor, and also found to also have some inhibition of um, cyclooxygenase activity. And it acts majorly on the uh, on the of the uh, subset receptor of A1 and A2. A to A of the adenosine receptor. So this leads to anti neuropathic pain, neurosensitive pain, and inflammatory models. I must say, this is found in model, majorly. Then uh, in a study of about 30, uh, of about 30, uh, about 30 studies conducted, I mean, derived over 20 years, they find that the, the, the potency for um, caffeine as adjuvant is is about four for uh, especially NSAIDs and paracetamol containing caffeine. I mentioned that majorly uh, the, as an adjuvant when you com when it combines with NSAIDs and paracetamol. And um, it, apart from the fact that it, 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 it can combine with other analgesics to produce a better effect, on itself, 
it has some intrinsic analgesic property. Uh, a meta-analysis of 19 eligible studies involved about 7,238 participants, reported about 5 to 10% more participants achieve good level of pain relief, that's about 50% of the maximum possible, with addition of between 10, uh, between 100 and 300 milligrams of caffeine when added to NSAIDs over four to six hours. And they find no adverse effect even when it's above 100 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, when uh, caffeine is added to the NSAID, like ibuprofen, it, um, it increases potency by up to like up, up to 2.8 times, that's about three times the um, its normal action. Then when combined with paracetamol, it enhances the efficacy of paracetamol. So caffeine and analgesic, in summary, increases the number of people with good pain relief by up to five to 10% compared when those analgesics are taken alone. Apart from that, it helps to fight fatigue and provide a sense of well-being. We, we, I mentioned around that caffeine is actually a stimulant. So what are the facts and myths about caffeine when used an, an, as an analgesic adjuvant. Caffeine is in a study of about 30 clinical studies involved more than 10,000 patients using at least 65 milligrams of caffeine. They found a reduced amount of analgesic needed by 40%. So that's thus suggesting that adding caffeine to um, NSAIDs actually helps in increasing their efficacy. Another myth is addition of caffeine to analgesic has no benefit. No doubt, as I mentioned earlier, that's benefit. And by adding caffeine to analgesic, as I mentioned earlier, um, add, add, a, add a good level of pain relief by as much as five to 10% compared with analgesic alone. Also in addition to, addition of caffeine to, um, caffeine to analgesic also helps to reduce the discomfort, lethargy, enhance, enhances mood, alertness, and exercise performance. Another myth is caffeine has no role in tension type of headache. Um, it has, studies have revealed that in tension type of headache, treatment with ibuprofen and caffeine provided a significant greater analgesic effect than when prof, ibuprofen alone was given or caffeine alone to, to such a patient. And we're not surprised because of its level of, uh, of its um, bioavailability. It, it, it penetrates through the brain barrier and be able to affect these actions in the brain. Another myth is caffeine is an opioid and not safe to, to take on a regular basis. That's not true. It's a naturally occurring compound. Of course, some of the opioids too, uh, have some um, natural origin but it is not. It has been in use for at least 500 years. And we find it in so many food that we take on a regular basis, from coffee to tea, to cola drinks, to energy drinks, or even chocolate. The caffeine is harmful when added to analgesic. It's another meat. Um, consumption of caffeine up to 500 milligrams daily is not harmful to health. I mentioned that you begin to see the toxic level from 10 milligrams. So this value is far, 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 about 10% of the level at which it becomes toxic. Another myth is caffeine at a lower dose when giving less than 100 milligrams per day causes withdrawal headache. Um, withdrawal headache develops because those individuals who are taking uh, the, the, the combination of NSAID and caffeine already frequent um, ca I mean, coffee uh, taker. So when individual takes uh, uh, about more than 200 milligrams for more than two weeks, then it may actually result in that. Otherwise, most people don't take as much as this. And it has, it, 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 it's not likely to cause withdrawal headache. It's caffeine. caffeine is not safe to use in medicinal products. Food and Drug Administration in America uh, classify 
uh, caffeine as a substance generally recognized as safe. So when it's been taken as up to 400 milligrams per day, does not raise any safety concern. Another myth is caffeine stimulates potential for drugs. This is not true. There is Overuse. Now, the effect of taking um, the analgesic um, the analgesic synergy between caffeine, non-cellular anti-inflammatory drugs, and paracetamol. From this um, slide, we see uh, most of this earlier on. I don't want to bother myself, but I can, we can see that when with caffeine, it has. Um, it, it potentiates the action of the ibuprofen, for instance, for up to eight, up to three times its normal action. And um, another study revealed that it's superior when it comes to about, um, 150 milligrams. Um, when caffeine is combined with an, um, paracetamol, it tends to actually help reducing this migraine intensity. The, the next time, see talk more about this. The, with the combination of ibuprofen, paracetamol, and caffeine, the synergistic effect is very clear. Uh, ibuprofen of 400 milligrams, paracetamol of 10 milligrams, uh, used as pre pre preemptive analgesia, compared with placebo in 54 patients, um, in visual analog scale, as described by the previous um, speaker, um, so, I mean, recorded before and up to eight hours. Shows that consistently are more effective than placebo in mean pain relief of, of up to like maximum, uh, that's maximum at four hours. When it's compared with ibuprofen of 400 milligram, which is a control, um, so dental surgery, in about 25 patients, it's, there's a greater pain relief with combination compared with control alone. Um, when it comes to um, muscle pain, in a study design, in which um, about five milligram per kg body weight of caffeine was used for with moderate, um, sorry, I mean, with, with a most of um, significant reduction in, in the muscle pain intensity rating compared with placebo injection, both equal to minus 0 0.24 and the high D minus 0 0.5 in caffeine consumer. So caffeine associated with reduction in muscle pain intensity when used alone or also when compared with other drugs. Caffeine is, um, is to be used as it's being, being, being used right now. In the meta-analysis, the risk of, of, of risk, uh, the benefit of analysis combined with caffeine in short Conditions were conducted in which more 100 milligrams and caffeine of 130 milligrams was used while the other group are one gram. The results showed the benefit of um, achieving at least 50 percent pain relief paracetamol caffeine group compared with the paracetamol alone group, and that was about 1.1 across the number of acute pain. I include period pain, headache, postpartum pain, and dental pain. So there's no compelling data to suggest a clinically meaningful increase in epilepsy. The as, uh, with uh, caffeine. 
when we use paracetamol of one gram and caffeine. So what are the factors affecting the efficacy of caffeine? The dose, we, I mentioned earlier on that in most of the preparations, usually if you hardly you get anything, it's really between uh, 65, can be as low as 65, to about 100 to 150. So in, in such a case, it's, um, it's an infant to be effective. Of course, study reveal that doses as much as 300 you, uh, is more effective than that dose. dose but so I reveal that even a dose of 65 milligrams, 100 milligrams is very effective. Regular coffee intake. Um, there is a known fact that people, there is what's called ca caffeine tolerance in those who take coffee regularly. In this type of patient, uh, caffeine, I mean, caffeine containing drugs may not be as efficient in those people who are taking um, coffee. Uh, smoking, in particular, in among smokers, uh, because of the smoking history, they may need a little bit more caffeine than the normal population. Why pregnancy and people um, 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 uh, individuals taking oral contraceptives tends to take a lower dose of caffeine. It's more effective at lower dose. This type of patient, more than 300 to 500 drugs have re one reaction or the other with caffeine. So one care must be taken when coffee when caffeine is being given, especially with other drugs. Genetics. A study revealed that uh, there are some genetic um, I mean, factors that affect the caffeine metabolism. And we, there are studies to reveal that we inherit some of them from our parents. And also the race. Um, study revealed that among the Asians, they are, they are, when, it, when it comes to caffeine, they are less tolerant of caffeine than other races. Toxicity of caffeine. I mentioned before that um, usually not seen in the dose at which you are taking a common coffee or in or when taken in combination with other drugs. But when um, caffeine intake per time is more than 10, equal to or more than 10 grams, which is about 150 to 200 milligrams per kg of body weight. This is way, way above what individual takes as a coffee and also what we find in the drugs, then it may cause acute fatal overdose. Usually it may be, um, for a mild caffeine overdose, we should treat symptomatically. But in severe overdose, so the patient may have to be intubated, especially when there is um, changes in mental status. Um, GCS, that's Glasgow Scoma Scale, going below equal to or less than eight, or patients have to vomit, we need to protect the airway to, to prevent aspiration. Another um, management include giving activated taco to such patient or hemodialysis. And this to further prevent complication, other, any other complication like um, what I mentioned before, to prevent, to, to prevent absorption and heat metabolism. When benzodiazepines, diazepam, midazolam can be given to the patient, one, to prevent seizure and also to treat seizure when we see them. The intravenous fluid, uh, crystalloids, and um, vasopressors may have to be given to the patient, especially those who develop hypotension. And when arrhythmias are associated with this overdose, the magnesium and beta blocking drugs, actually, or other anti arrhythmic drugs can be given to the patient. So, take, take home message includes that caffeine is an important analgesic adjuvant to paracetamol and and NSAIDs like ibuprofen. And addition of caffeine to analgesic increases analgesic potency up to like 40%. And we've seen study metallics that show even up to 50%. And that the safety issues are minimal, particularly when low dose of caffeine are being used, especially up to like 50, 50 milligrams as an adjuvant in analgesic formulation. And safety concerns should not prevent uh, us prescribing uh, the potential. Also, that the dose that is usually added to this um, um, drug in combination actually far, far less 
about below what can cause toxicity. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Olusola and Dr. Milton. Uh, Dr. Rapp, I really appreciate such an impressive uh, session. It is your session was really very much in detail at the same time, very, very simplified. Uh, I particularly like uh, the physiology part uh, on multimodal analgesia. At point, I felt like I'm attending a cryptology class. And you went on dissecting the code so smoothly about multimodal analgesia. I have taken the notes uh, and I'm sure I am not going to forget uh, this concept which you have correlated with six bullets coming from the gun of uh, the, the healthcare practitioner. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ulusulat. Uh, thanks to you too, uh, for, for putting forward the facts about caffeine, which some of the facts I knew I know for the first time through your presentation. So when I will have a sip of coffee next time, this, this physiology of caffeine is going to uh, definitely pop up in my mind. Uh, I also like Dr. Olusula, uh, th those myths and facts which you have covered so nicely uh, because I, I, I have learned many times that uh, this is very common uh, misconception uh, among us, the people, or even among us healthcare professionals. Some of them, they consider caffeine as an opioid, but thank you uh, so much giving clarity on that. It is not an opioid. That is why it doesn't have opioid-like safety issues, uh, like abuse potential and addiction. Thank you so much, both the speakers. Now, this is time for a uh, question and answer session. And... Uh, I will take up some of the questions coming from the audience straight away. Uh, I request both the speakers to uh, respond to them one by one. So the first question, I think it will go towards uh, Dr. Ra. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, is a multifactorial disease, uh, typical for different ages. So what do you think, sir? What is, what, what is the position of uh, new some new medicines like biologicals or uh, Janus kinase inhibitor drugs as and uh, NSID is ibuprofen paracetamol combination in the management of uh, autoimmune disorder. Sure, it's, it's uh, quite a complicated question to answer, but please understand in the historical treatment versus the modern treatment, what we are doing today is in fact trying to save tissue. We are trying to prevent changes. We are trying to get rid of the permanent scarring. So the earlier, the better. And as you know, although they're very expensive, the biologicals have become the primary treatment for the disease, the so-called disease-sparing drugs, DSDs. However, um, historically, what would happen is drugs like methotrexate and steroids were given just to comp to uh, control the inflammatory process. Um, it's still used in many parts of the world, and the simple reason being that the um, disease-sparing drugs are extremely expensive. So in the developing world, you will be treating patients with almost poison, methotrexate and steroids as the basis of therapy. But let us uh, look at it in, in more uh, exacting terms. So if the drugs fail to control the patient with the biologicals and there are acute exacerbations, then acute pain therapy becomes pertinent. Now, on the biologicals, many of them are not taking anything but the biologicals. So there's no reason on earth why they can't take the NSAIDs and the coxibs and paracetamol in acute outbreaks. There's no reason on earth why one can't do that. Um, what limits which one you use is obviously the gastric, gastrointestinal susceptibility, bleeding issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and whether they are or are not on steroids. So if they're on steroids, uh, the addition of an NSAID, even a coxib, is probably not a good idea because... Uh, you basically are supplying a drug to a system which is already inhibited because, as you know, the steroids work by major prostaglandin inhibition. So there is no place for it, but paracetamol and codeine and even opioids become pertinent. 
when they are on steroids and they are on anti-inflammatories, uh, as I said earlier, and they now have acute exacerbations, it, it, it behoves us really to add stronger drugs. And, and again, it depends on where you are because the stronger drugs then become the opioid type drugs. And of course, one can start with, uh, I'm going to call it low potency opioids such as caffeine, not caffeine, codeine, my apologies, such as codeine. And if you're adding codeine to it, well, of course, there are many side effects to the codeine profile. And if you're going towards the morphine, there is, of course, the opiophobia and the addiction problems, and everyone's worrying about that. But let me reassure the, the uh, audience that short-term use of even morphine for short-term will not lead to addiction. And in fact, it's a very well-known fact that we know in world bodies that patients in real chronic pain, you can give them as much opioid as they want. They will never become addicted because that is the nature of the beast. It is the person who doesn't have pain, who's seeking drugs, who will become the opioid addict. So again, I put to you, you have to know your patient. You have to know exactly what they're on. And when they are on steroids, be careful of NSAIDs. When they're not on steroids, certainly NSAIDs become applicable. Again, making sure that they're not on any sort of, uh, let's even call it toxic drugs, such as, as um the other old drugs that are used for rheumatoid arthritis. When you're dealing with osteoarthritis, certainly the combinations we're talking about today are very applicable and you can use them at liberty. But just be careful that they don't have contraindications and steroid use. Perfect. And I hope that answers the question as, uh, as we yes, can. Very much, very much. And thanks for. Uh, thanks for covering osteoarthritis also, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Your next question, uh, I guess it goes to Dr. Ulusula. Uh, so, Dr. Ulusula, is caffeine, uh, whether it can be taken by a person suffering from gastric ulcer, is it safe to be taken? Uh, it, it depends on uh, the, the, the dose. You could see that um, even the common coffee that we take regularly, um, some as, as low as 65, 100 milligram per um, in mint, while some, the what they refer to as high grade coffee, can contain as much as 500 milligrams. And that's much. So, but in most of the doses, um, the, um, the uh, I would say scientifically, I have not seen, uh, I've, I've not been. I've come across any paper to show me that everyone is a real clinical study. But these are the at which we've been seeing 65. I think most people should be able to tolerate that. And if after twice converting, it is not it's going to be, it's most unlikely. That's my take on it. When you're talking about it, which will not only reduce the the use of the drug, the identity of two, but the amount of it is quite reduced. I, I don't think it should cause any uh, gastric irritation. But if I thought it causes that, then the drug can Well, uh, Dr. Olusula, we are facing some uh, network issue from your side. Uh, there, there, your voice is breaking, Dr. Olusula. Okay, uh, but we have got uh, okay. uh, the answer here, right? Thanks for answering that. Uh, I will, I will prefer to move on to the next question here. I request Dr. Rapp to uh, reply to this question, sir. Uh, in combination products. Uh, what is the recommended strength of paracetamol, whether it is 500 milligram or 325 milligram? Um, that's a fairly easy answer. So if you look at the, the, the pharmacopoeia of essential drugs as the WHO recommends it, and you look at what uh, the, remember the WHO only recommends four products, although there are hundreds around the world of, of different combinations. But if you look at the FDA, 
the dosage recommended is 325 milligrams per tablet. Um, and that's recommended by the FDA. But if you look around the world at different presentations, you'll find there's anything from 200 to 500. But to say I would stick with a 325 as that is the FDA recommended dose. Great. Thanks, sir. Uh, I'll move on to our next question. It, it looks like it is uh, more related to physiology. Uh, which hormone is responsible for pain and how does NSAIDs affect leukotrienes? I think there are two separate questions here, sir. So hormonal, forget about the hormones. I mean, you saw if I went through the physiology, there's no hormones involved in pain. Certainly there's hormones involved in menstrual pain and abdominal pain and different types of it, but hormones don't really play the physiological role that we're looking at. So uh, really to, to forget that. When we look at leukotrienes, again, if you looked at the physiology, as it says, once the skin has been sensitized, arachidonic acid has been released and then has formed prostaglandins, what you will then see is the onset of the inflammatory soup. The body will then react to the prostaglandins by leukotrienes, antileukins, um, bradykinin, histamine, serotonin. So that whole inflammatory soup is related to the onset of the analgesia initially inflammatory wise by prostaglandin action. And once they have been created and you have not prevented them, then the cascade goes. So they're early on in the physiological cascade, even before it starts getting conducted to the spinal cord. So it's a peripheral inflammatory action that the leukotrienes are involved in. Okay. Uh, and so next question is, uh, it is about this practice. Uh, and one of the audience is asking, in, in my practice, I have always avoided the use of opioids in patient with head injury. Is there an option that is safer in, in such patients? Did you say with head injury? With head injury. Okay, so neurosurgically, let's call it neurosurgically. When you look at neurosurgery, one of the problems one doesn't want to use is any sedative drug whatsoever, any sedative drug, as one wishes to evaluate this patient in terms of level of consciousness, function, cerebral function, etc. So, of course, opioids do that, the benzodiazepines do it, uh, there, there is uh, various classes of drugs that do it, but that doesn't mean you cannot give the patient analgesia. I mean, that is that is inhumane. So one's got to look at what is actually being used. And there are products being used. Um, let's say post-surgically, just to give you an example, one will be using drugs like tramadol. But the most commonly used, if you want to treat a head injury, because it will not affect the, the LOC level of consciousness, is DF-118. And so that is opioid without suppression, and it's the most common opioid used by the neurosurgical fraternity and anesthesiology fraternity involved with head injuries, surgery of the brain, surgery of the spine. So DF-118 is recommended, followed probably by tramadol in lower doses. Fine. And... Uh... Next question, uh, I probably it goes to both the speakers. Uh, which is the most safe for analgesia for pregnant women? And what is the safety of caffeine in pregnancy? Well, I'll answer the first part of it. The answer is the best drug is no drug. Okay, that's the best drug. However, it has been deemed acceptable from, look, in the first trimester, you should use absolutely nothing. There are no studies. You cannot do much. But thereafter... It has been deemed reasonable to use paracetamol, but nothing more. Remember, using NSAIDs or one of the others can affect the foramen ovale, it can keep it patent. We use these things to, to prevent closing of the foramen ovale, et cetera, et cetera. So really, the best drug is no drug. But if you have to use something, the only one deemed safe and acceptable is paracetamol. And of course, local anesthetics, depending on what the pain is. 
So if you can, for example, if it's a fracture or something, you can block it quite happily or a, a superficial wound. But otherwise, you've got to unfortunately stay away from systemic drugs because even the trials would be unethical to even try and do a trial in a pregnant woman to see if it's going to affect the fetus. So again, I say the best drug is no drug, but paracetamol seems to be acceptable in the IV and oral form. Uh, but I'll leave it to Dr. Dawi just to, to speak about the caffeine in pregnancy. <laughs> well, I, I totally agree with my, with my senior colleague, no, no doubt. Uh, because no, no, nobody will approve any study that has to do with pregnancy. Nobody will do that. So any, anybody taking drug during pregnancy is just taking this at its own risk. So then, if, I, if you check most of the drug pamphlets, you see when it comes to pregnancy, they're always kind of silent about it or not even mention it at all. For the same reason, you don't want to do any study that has to do with mommy. So, I, I, I guess uh, with um, what I'm not 100 percent sure of is, um, as we've been told, paracetamol is safe in, in, uh, during pregnancy, especially minus not the fourth trimester because of the organogenesis, blah blah blah. But what I'm not saying is that adding caffeine to it at a lower dose, I don't think that should be. But I will not recommend it. That would just be my own <laughs> personal opinion. I don't have any science behind that and which will not be acceptable so i, I guess price tamo okay local anesthetics okay um, um caffeine containing drugs um if it's if it's low dose maybe like 65 milligram of caffeine i may risk it but i must say that that is my opinion it has no scientific basis at all i've not done any study to confirm that and the patient will be told so it's not as if um, I just give it to them straight. No, they have been informed for for going ahead. Got it, sir. Thank you so much. Now I will move to last question. Uh, I request Dr. Rapp to please uh, reply to that. Uh, is there any drug interaction between analgesics uh, and and steroids? Non-steroidal analgesics and steroids. So the answer is it's not an interaction, but it's a potentiation. Remember, if you look at the, um, the release of steroids as such, they are one step before the prostaglandins. So if you are giving anti-inflammatory in the form of steroid therapy, adding anti-inflammatories doesn't add to it, but it can add to the side effect profile. And as you know, long-term steroid use with the bleeding and the soft tissues, et cetera, et cetera, now go and add an anti-inflammatory which potentiates that. It can hurt the gut. It can cause clotting abnormalities. It, it's not a good idea. So steroids are, steroids are king and the NSAIDs are one down. But the ultimate thing that they do is they suppress the inflammatory response that we spoke about. Um, so a nice way of saying it is the steroid is actually the ultimate anti-inflammatory. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's any good reason to use both together, especially in a patient who's on long-term steroid. Yes, short-term, one shot of steroid, you've got a head injury, you've got one shot of steroid, nothing long, Decadron or one of those things. There's nothing wrong with that. And then continuing therapy thereafter with NSAIDs. But on long-term therapy or in acute, it's not really going to do anything. Because if you've got no prostaglandins, you've got no prostaglandins. So adding another drug, which is an anti-prostaglandin, is not going to help you at all. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to both the speakers for, for wonderful sessions which you have delivered. They are, they are quite educative. I have personally learned a lot today. And I'm sure our audience is going to take a very rich take home messages about the pain management by using this multimodal analgesia approach. Uh, I would also like to thank our audience for taking time from your busy schedule uh, and uh, to attend our webinar. Uh, thank you so much for your regular feedback responses uh, to our programs. and. Uh, uh, soon we, we will share the recorded version of this session in case if you are joined late today or if you have missed some part of the program. And uh, you can always reply back to the email which you will receive with your feedback, with your suggestions, topic suggestion it can be, you can reply to that email. And uh, I will also like to thank uh, all the accrediting uh, 
uh, professional societies and associations across the Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you to all and thank you.